for cultivating progress across the South, for working to unconditionally improve the lives of all, and for the bold underwriting of every Gravy podcast, SFA thanks our visionary Louisville, Kentucky friends, Pam and Brooke Smith. Well, you can't see electricity, I'm moving on the line. How in the world can you doubt it when you can see it shine? When you I'm Mary Beth Lassiter. I'm Melissa Hall. We're your hosts for Gravy. 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 A production of the Southern Foodways Alliance, Gravy tells the stories of the changing American South. And this week, Gravy goes electric. It's electric. <laughs> Mary Beth, you have a lot of children. Oh, yes, four of them. Have you ever given any thought to what your days with those children would be like without electricity? Oh, goodness, heaven forbid. I would be stuck in the house amidst piles of laundry. My refrigerator would not work, which means there would be no cold milk for Mary Claire's Frosted Flakes. and We wouldn't have a toaster for Maggie's Pop-Tarts. It would be (laughs) awful. In this episode, Katie Jane Fernelius shares the shocking truths about the ways in which Electricity transformed domesticity. When we think of the industrialization of America and the rise of electricity, we're primed to think about people in cities and factories where machines and assembly lines abound. We think of Charlie Chaplin tangled up in conveyor belts and cogs in the movie Modern Times. We think of electric motors, coal mining, steam engines... But electricity transformed another area almost as much as it transformed the city or the factory. And that area is the house. It's the Westinghouse Total Electric Home. A home where electricity does everything. Heats, cools, illuminates, launders, preserves and prepares foods, entertains. It even lights a path to the front door. And because of that, there's one really key demographic that's impacted by electricity perhaps more than any other. And that's women. Nowhere does the role of electricity in changing what we expected from women and how we viewed them become more apparent than in advertising. When you step inside the total electric home, you step into an entirely new concept in living. So you have a period of intense advertising to upper middle class households in the 1910s and 20s, where electricity is a status symbol and a luxury good. This is Raquel Adini. She used to work in advertising and market analysis, but now is a literary and cultural studies scholar at the University of Roehampton in London, England. Her book, All Electric Narratives, focuses on how advertising and literature represented electricity and electric appliances in the home. There was an air of magic and prestige to these new appliances, not dissimilar to the awe and excitement marketing campaigns create today around a Tesla vehicle or a new model of iPhone. In her book, she references a print ad where people in ball gowns and suits crowd around a general electric refrigerator to admire it. They created a new style sensation, reads the ad. To be clear, the wealthy white women were not shown using the appliances. Presumably, they had domestic workers for that. For many American households, the role of women and the role of housework were changing rapidly with the Industrial Revolution and electrification. The start of a woman's day, but only the start. Because a woman is all things to all people. Instead of sharing responsibilities of the household, husbands were now generally expected to go to work to support the household through their wages. And women were generally expected to shop, cook, clean, and manage the household. Did you ever have to make a meal in 20 minutes, literally from the time you entered the kitchen until the meal was ready to serve? What had once been the work of multiple adults perhaps including extended family members or hired cooks or maids, now, in most middle- and working-class nuclear families, became the job of one woman, the so-called housewife. Because Sally is rapidly learning homemaking, she knows most of the basic techniques of good kitchen behavior and knows how to use the tools of the craft. 
So industrialization divides um, the home from the factory, right? So whereas um, many families used to work, everyone would work in the home and divide household labor and, and the children and the parents would, you know, cook and clean and do all this stuff together. Industrialization puts an end to that, right? And on top of that, there's a question of uh, women and children in the factory suppressing wages because they could be paid less. So there's a drive to get women back in the home in order to keep men's wages up, right? So in the name of safety. Um, and then there's a question of what do we do with these women? One answer to that question was home economics. During industrialization, home economics emerged as a new academic discipline that explored not just how to cook and clean and care for the household, but also how to be a smart consumer of new technologies for the household, like kitchen appliances. So on the one hand, home economics is very much a kind of conservative effort to justify keeping women in the home using the language of scientific management. But, you know, this is also the same time as the suffragette movement. There are also socialist and feminist um, women at the time who are harnessing home economics as a way to prove that women play an important role in society, to say, because women do so much in the home, they should be allowed to vote. Because they are raising our children and feeding our husbands, they should have that. And the socialists among them, so for instance, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, is seeing this as a way to promote collectivist ideals. So she was into cooperative kitchens, for instance, as a way to share the workload. So what I think is fascinating is that the home becomes a site of competing ideologies, right? So women who are saying, you know, that women should stay at home and that's all they should do and they should be kept busy managing the home and other women who are saying that that in turn should allow them rights outside of it. So I think it's more complex than just saying that women ran cooperatives or just saying that they were all conservative. Advertisements for these appliances channeled many different political ideologies of a changing America. In one ad for General Electric, the copy reads, The suffrage and the switch. Women's suffrage made the American woman the political equal of her man. The little switch, which commands the great servant electricity, is making her workshop the equal of her man's. In some ways, home economics helped create the advertising vernacular for selling appliances for the household, not only promoting convenience, hygiene, and efficiency, but also instructing women consumers on how best to use them, just like a home economist would. But electric companies were just as eager, if not more, to advertise through the image of a perfect housewife as they were the image of a political woman. And it was this housewife that began to circulate more frequently in advertisements after World War I, and certainly became dominant and widespread in the ads after World War II. And the housewife's dominion was the kitchen. You have You Live Better Electrically, which is this nationwide campaign across television, print media, TV spots, and quizzes. You can find these quizzes, right, in women's magazines where that you fill out, to, you, you tick the box of how many appliances you own, right? And then based on the number, you're either um, backward or okay or doing great. And that's basically based on how, like, how much you have automated your cooking. You can make your family's life much brighter. You will find your work much lighter. It's as easy as can be to live better electrically. You it's status affirming. Um, so their gold medallion campaign, for instance, was one where if you had a particular standard of electrification in your home and if you had a certain number of appliances, you live better electrically would send you a medallion that you could then put on the front of your home. You don't have to work and slave. Let electricity do it for you. you can have so the all-electric kitchen came to represent not just a modern lifestyle, but the modern housewife as well. To be so free when you live better electrically. As anyone who's ever successfully unmolded a congealed salad can tell you, electricity has the power to make you fancy. When we come back, we'll learn how the electric kitchen was marketed to sell electricity itself, this time to rural Americans. 
If you like this podcast, we think you'll love reading our print quarterly. It's called, you guessed it, Gravy. You can subscribe to Gravy by becoming an SFA member at southernfoodways.org or purchase a copy through our friends at Hub City Press in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Visit hubcity.org to order the current issue. In the coming months, you might see Gravy on the shelf at your local bookstore. Ask your bookseller to stock it. SFA thanks Hub City Press for helping us serve more gravy. Since the picture you are about to see was produced, the rural electrification situation has changed greatly. By we talked today about the digital divide, uh, people who you know, are computer savvy, internet savvy, and those who aren't. This was an electrical divide back in that day. People who didn't have electricity had to work a whole lot harder. This is 1940, but the farm woman today is long. They don't complain to women like Hazel Parkinson, but they know on an August morning how hot the stove was going to be at noon. They may not say much about it, but they wish you could just turn a faucet to get your water the way you can in town. They know, and their children know, the work that goes into raising food for a nation. Those clips you hear are from Power in the Land, a government-funded documentary to chronicle New Deal efforts. In this case, the effort to electrify rural America. And that man you heard? Well, uh, I'm Hal Wallace. I'm the curator of the electricity collections at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And I'm responsible for about 25,000 objects that document the history of electrical science and many electrical technologies. We talked before the break about how electricity sold the American dream. An American dream that for wealthier white women meant being a perfect housewife in the electrified suburban home just like June Cleaver. That dream hinged on electricity making possible a life of abundance through its promise of productivity, efficiency, and ease. But it was a dream that fell out of reach to some Americans. People are aware, people in rural America are aware of the changes that are taking place in the United States. And they understand that technologically this divide is getting bigger. Yes, there is a machine to do the wash, but it runs by electricity. There are lamps you don't have to clean and trim and fill, but they run by electricity. Here on the farm where it's needed most, electricity is hard to get. By the early 1930s, private power companies had built out the electric grid in most cities. Electrifying a city block could earn them a large customer base within a small, dense area. But these same companies largely neglected rural areas. It took too much effort for too little reward to extend power lines to these small, remote communities. There's one great quote from this one gentleman who says, you know, we were after the private power companies for years to to give us electricity. Uh, Do you think they would come out here? I think not. In fact, fewer than one in 10 rural communities had access to electricity when President Franklin Roosevelt took office in 1933. This was a period when a large percentage of the U.S. population was involved in agriculture and raising the nation's food supply. And younger people especially were leaving the farms for the cities. There were jobs there and factories, and there are the bright city lights and and the the nightlife and, and all of the modern conveniences that you don't have to put up with on the farm. Um, And so there's a real concern about securing the nation's food supply and getting electrification out there to help meet this demand for modern conveniences and what was seen as uh, essentially a modern lifestyle. And so that's that's a big part of, it's not just the technology, but it's the social aspects, uh, a big part of what's going on with rural electrification in the 1930s. So Roosevelt and Congress established the Rural Electrification Administration, or REA for short. 
The REA incentivized local communities to form their own electric cooperatives by providing technical know-how and low-cost long-term loans so that they could build their own infrastructure for electricity. To promote this program, the REA decided to fund a tour throughout rural America, which would showcase all that electricity could do. It became known as the REA Electric Circus. It really was like a circus. They went out of their way to popularize it, to do advanced publicity. You know, the, you know, the REA Electric Circus is coming to town in a month or whatever, and, and get, get it on people's radar so that they would then, you know, be curious enough to come out and look. Just like the electric appliance companies, the federally sponsored electric circus sold a vision of the modern electric home with the modern electric kitchen and the modern housewife at its center. Perhaps that is why one of the ringleaders of the circus was not only an electrification specialist, but a home economist. Her name was Louisanne Mamer. You know, one really doesn't appreciate what a degree in home economics is until one looks at her college notebook, which was part of the papers that she donated. I had the opportunity to look through this because I, I never took home ec when I was in, in high school. But reading through her notebook, she's doing laboratory experiments on how foods, for example, caramelize when they're heated or how the proteins might rearrange in an egg as, as it's being heated and why these things. So there's a lot of science involved, you know, real science involved with this. Louisanne Mamer used her home economist background to guide audiences through the changing American home. How to skillfully place your light bulbs to illuminate your living room. How to launder your husband's work shirts and your washing machine. And how to scramble eggs on an electric stove. Female team members, like Ms. Mamer, are in the farmhouse uh, teaching farm women, okay, here's how you cook something. And here's, you know, if you cook it this way over an over a, a open flame, it's going to cook this way. But when you shift to electricity, you have to cook things a little bit differently. Uh, she said one of her favorite parts was the cook-off that they would set up between two men in the, um, in the community and uh, see which one could cook something better. Hal says that in addition to being a skilled home economist, Louisa Mamer was also a valuable cultural go-between, bridging the cultural divides that might exist between the government employees and rural Americans. She grew up on a farm without electricity without running water, you know, she, you know, knew what that life was like. And as much as she was a technical liaison between the REA and rural America, she was a cultural liaison. She could talk to country people in their own terms. So there's this wonderful draft example of a brochure that REA drew up to talk about the program. Here's what REA is all about. And they sent it to her for comments. And in the margins are these uh, almost not stick figures exactly, but very rudimentary drawings of different people, you know, kind of happy, smiling people that you, know, you would expect in any kind of public relations document. And one of them depicts you know, a, your friendly REA agent, and it's a gentleman drawn with a mustache. And she writes in big red letters right next to it, no mustache. To country people, mustache is a city slicker who's going to take you for everything you've got. No mustache. And they listened to her. <laughs> they, they redid the drawing and, and, and before they issued the publication. The REA's Electric Circus first operated from 1939 to 1941 before going on a brief hiatus during World War II. But once the war was over, the circus began touring again. And it worked. By the 1950s, over 90% of rural America was electrified, most through cooperatives. 
often after a co-op was set up and, ever, and the power was flowing, they would have this ceremony where they would ceremoniously bury an old oil lamp or kerosene lantern with a, and there's this wonderful picture of this one with a little tombstone saying, here, here rests this oil lamp that's been displaced by you know, electric lighting. When Louisa Mamer retired in 1981, she was called the first lady of the REA due to her nearly five-decade-long career in the administration. For Hal, who spoke with me over Zoom, the impacts of Louise and Mamer in the REA remain deeply meaningful today. Full disclosure, I'm, I'm coming to you from Southern Maryland here as a member of the Southern Maryland Rural Electric Cooperative. So, you know, I get my electricity from, from a, a rural cooperative. Really? Yes. Oh my goodness. That is so fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. so. Wow. Mm-hmm. Today, we reasonably expect to have access to electricity wherever we go in America. Even if we understand the extent to which electricity makes possible so much of what we do, from using a microwave to listening to this podcast, we probably don't think much about all the cultural values that were packaged along with it. Electric companies and the government both channeled familiar American values and manufactured new ideals in order to spread the electric lifestyle. And housewives in their electric kitchens were starring characters in those marketing campaigns. Gravy was reported and produced by Katie Jane Fernelius. Buy her a cocktail, and she'll tell you about the time actress Jessica Liu played a character based on Katie in a Lifetime movie. Wow. We thank Katie King for being our fact checker. We thank Wendell Patrick for Gravy's theme music, Jazar for our donor music. Managing editor for Gravy and all other SFA media is Sarah Camp Milam. Visit us at southernfoodways.org to become a member or make a donation. Your dollars fund our good work and help us make more gravy. I'm Mary Beth Lassiter. I'm Melissa Hall. Excited to lap up another episode of Gravy? Tell a friend. Pass the gravy boat. There's plenty to go around. <laughs>